The ceremony is about, about healing, it's about dancing the spirit back into the land, dancing the spirit back into ourselves. We go through ceremony to make sure that we've got enough spirit within ourselves to go out and do this healing. Healing this land, healing the rivers. Poor old Mother Earth has suffered enough. Bring the, the rain down to fill the rivers up again. Aboriginal dances revive the spirit. The ceremonies that we do are very important. We went all the way to Mara Mara. Um, yeah, it was good to go all the way up to Queensland and dance through all of the communities and that and come back into Nalanjeri country and finish up at Goa. The ringbalan is a Ngarinjiri word that means ceremony, means singing, means dancing, means different ways you can express your feelings in ceremony. The ceremony is about including other people so that people will start to come together for a purpose of healing. The ceremony is about healing this country, healing this river, but also about healing our people. What the Ngarinjari call miwi, the spirit that lives inside of us, is to heal that. Because that fire that's there is slowly going away. We've got to evoke the old spirits, the sleepy, and get them to get up and, and help us to bring the, the rain down, to fill the rivers up again. We know they're resting, but we know, know they had skills that we need today, that a lot of our people have lost. And by dancing on the river and singing up the river, we're calling on them to help and support us. That's the way I look at it anyway. Welcome to... Rika. We seen how our rivers were dying, our, our lakes, our country was very sick. It's a place, a private reservoir that's got more water than Sydney Arbor in. And all they use that for is farming, cotton and rice. Why would anyone in their right mind have cotton and rice in a country as dry as Australia? That's draining the energy, draining everything out of the earth, out of Mother Earth, out of our, our what we're going to we, Nink we Rui. I believe our poor old Mother Earth has suffered enough with all the drilling for oil and gas and you name it. You know, there's hardly any, any decent organs left on, in Mother Earth. All the minerals they're getting out of it. So, you know, I feel for Mother Earth. I really do. I said, we were thought to walk softly on the earth. Our mother, you know, on the land. And then you've got these giant machines coming in, raping the land and doing everything, you know, out of the ordinary to it. Our old people would be turning over in their graves if they knew what was going on today. But I think it's wrong that they only listen to certain people. We've been speaking out for years about 
the destruction of our waterways here, but we never ever get a decent response back. So I don't know, sometimes I feel like getting the old spirits to work a bit more harder. You know, at least they're on our side. A lot of my old people now, they won't eat anything out of the river because they, they worry that it'll make them sick because they see the, the water looking so sick. You know, and we, we want a healthy river and we want to be able to use, utilise all the resources available from the river. You know, and, and along with that, you know, our old people have started changing their diets to a Western diet because they can't eat traditional food anymore. And that's why we get heart disease and we get kidney disease and cholesterol and yeah, the whole the whole raft of health issues from a very bad diet. The Menindee Lakes area was rich and abundant in food for the Aboriginal people who used to live around the lakes years ago. They had access to just about a great big supermarket. <coughs> it was beautiful. You had plenty of, of water life, the fish and the ducks and whatever, the eggs from them. And then you had the meat around the edges, the rabbits, the gillars, the whatever, kangaroos, emus. And our old people used to come from the mission, which is 11 kilometres northeast of Menindee, in a horse and cart, and they'd kill the emu out here in the lake and cook the emu in the hole the traditional way. And then they'd wait until it was cooked, maybe three or four hours, and then, and then they'd take it home in the cart and carve it up to the people on the mission. And, you know, we used to come out here as children and play around the lake's edge as well. And we used to come across some of these, the holes that the old people dug and the bones, the remnants of the emus that were around. Sometimes they'd have a feast out here and leave the bones, you know. So we, I guess we, it lo looked like we were looking for the footprints of our people and we found them by the bones left behind. My uncles who were in their late 70s, when they were kids, they tell me stories of how they used to dive for pennies in the bottom of the river at Swan Hill, and yeah, you know they could see fish, big cod swimming in the river, and now you know there's it's so dirty that you can't see anything in there. Uh, we we're lucky down this stretch of the river because it it gets a little bit of clarity down here, but you know I I drove from Swan Hill today, and you could just see the dirty river all the way along till we get down here. And once they put the carp in, that's when everything went twice as muddy. No, they'll never, it'll never come back to crystal clear. We can see the yabby digging the holes in the river banks and everything. Not today. The ceremony we've been doing, travelling all the way up to Maramara, east of Kanamala. We travel up there. We start dancing out on the clay pan. Out on the dust. Dancing is just a little part of the ceremony. The belief in our ancestors. The belief that they're, they're there to help us. The belief that they will bring that water all the way down to the Murray Mouth, all the way down to our country. That's what this is about. How we bring that down there. How our ancestors will help us. Because that water is the lifeblood of this country. It's been like that for thousands and thousands of years. From when we, the people of this land, were the only ones here, we looked after that water. We looked after it. We missed out on a couple of floods because they diverted them into other tributaries up, up near the cotton fields. They were filling out, siphon water in and filling up dry riverbeds up top and not unbeknown to the people down south. You know, so we missed out on probably two full rivers that we should have had. But they don't want to hear about that.
Yeah. No, a sad situation. Oh, you know, it's, some people have to give a few things up. We can't keep going the way we have, you know, and, and this is where the basin plan came from. You know, the, the realisation that we'd overused the water resources in the basin and it was making the health of the whole environment suffer. But, um, you know, irrigation is, they're, they're a very strong voice, you know, and government listens to them. So they continually claw back water every time we try and get some wins for the environment. The, the irrigation lobby usually finds a way to get the water back. But, um, you know, they, they need to realise that they don't have to give everything up, just a bit of help. You know, if we all work together, it can be good for all of us. For years, people didn't listen. They didn't care what we said. They weren't interested. They weren't interested in, in how people felt. You just stay over there and keep your mouth shut. That's what you do. But now we've got a, a voice. And we need to build that voice by ourselves. We don't need to tell, be told, oh, you can speak now, you can do this now. No. We need to get the voice back for what we had for thousands and thousands of years. We need to get that back so that we be heard and say, well, okay, no. The water is supposed to be down here. You're pushing it somewhere else. All of our fruit, all of our freshwater plants, all of our swans, our other ngachis, our other friends, they suffer. When they suffer, we suffer. If water managers of today really start to include Aboriginal people in all the decision making, that it's a real possibility to have good, healthy waterways back and have plenty of fish in the river for us to eat. You know, it's, it's, um, it's easy. The, the competing interests all have to have one common goal in, in mind, and that is healthy rivers, healthy waterways, healthy people. As healthy as anything, it's crystal clear like the sea. Now it's all muddy and murky and everything else. We just got to keep looking up, I suppose, and hoping that things will happen, bring the rivers down. After just coming from the International River Symposium, I'm very optimistic because Nuttingerry Regional Authority actually took out the Australian River Prize this year. So the recognition that Aboriginal people have a big part to play in the restoration of our rivers is finally being recognised in the wider community. A lot of dull skills in regards to the weaving, whatever has been lost by a lot of people. The one thing that we continue on with is the making of weapons, uh, small like clap sticks and things, but uh, basket, uh, string, making ba 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 bags out of strings and so on. We still, a couple of us who still got that knowledge, we'll still sit down and work with string. But the older people used to do the, the weaving. But that's, you don't see many of them doing it around here now. And I think they look to South Australia and to down further along the Victoria Murray River to find people who can still do it. Hmm.
the Ringbelen is a ceremony that went down down the river, but it was also about teaching. You're learning the stories, you're learning the dances, you're learning how to interact with other groups, but you're also learning about how we made our clubs, made our artifacts, the basket weaving, and that was exchanged with other groups. The Ringbelen is not something just about dancing, it's about learning, teaching and experience and, and, you know, developing the skills for people to hand that down later on. They make their own artifacts, they make their own uh, designs around the Ngarinjiri. <laughs> A lot of this was traded down along the rivers, traded with our, our wood, traded with our shells, traded with the reed spears that we make. So, yeah, it was just to show that, that our culture is still very strong and our way of making, making artifacts is still strong. They use the rocks, they use the flint to smooth it up. That was a form of sandpaper. He learned by just watching. And same as all of us, you know, we learn by watching and listening to people. When I done it with my uncle, the same way. He set us down and said, well, this is how you make this. This is how you make this type of weapon. This is how you make this type of boomerang. This is how you make this type of uh, club. And and. It's just gonna, it'll go on like that all the time where people are sitting down doing this. And then later on down the track, Sean will be teaching somebody else. It's my first time making one. It's a challenge and you, yeah, just follow instructions, what Uncle Mugi says, and then you just do it. I can learn from it, I can teach. It's normally for um, fighting, you use it for hunting, but it's normally for fighting. I just gotta thin this bit out and you sew it, and then either end it will land, it will just go, it will get stuck in you. I, I just wish all the kids would be here. You know, it's something that we've got to do and continue on doing is passing on what we know. There's not many of us left who've got the knowledge but passing it on to the young ones in there to, to carry on. And it's a great, great idea to teach them when they're young like that, because they remember a lot more as we're teaching them when they're younger than what they would be when, if we taught them when they were in their late 20s. You could see the pride in, the, in their eyes, that they're proud of who they are and where they come from, and that their dancing isn't just something was made up, it was something that was it was a practice that was done for thousands of years and it's passed on from generation to generation and to these younger kids now. Our yeah, traditional culture and dances, um, there's wide interest for it, you know, and it really captures people, so, you know, and the, and the future generations love it, you know, the kids love it, so, you know, it's, it's a good focus point. The elders are like the um, bearers of knowledge and the keepers of country. So we should just continue passing down culture and knowledge to the next generation. So, because they're the next lot of elders, and we need to yeah respect each other and um, teach each other as much as we can. It's important to teach the young Nandiri children about their culture because when we get older, they need to teach their grandchildren and it goes on and on. Now, we've got the opportunity for, for people to, to see our ceremonies, for people to be involved in our ceremonies. Opportunity to teach our children, to teach the dancing, See, my grandfathers and that, they weren't allowed to do this. My mum and dad weren't allowed to do this. So what we're doing now is something that a lot of the old people that are sitting down and watching this, they never done. They never danced as children. 
Our ceremony, we're in practice. As my old uncle used to say, Uncle Tom Javori, he used to say, why are Knowing and believing in something. So it's about knowing your culture, knowing who you are, knowing where you come from and believing in it. There's roughly 70,000 Aboriginal people within the Murray-Darling Basin. You know, and to each and every one of us, the river's the central focus. It's, it's a core to our spirituality. Our, our culture has been built around living with our waterways and water is life. And you know, we, we view the environment as a holistic being with land, water and air. So um, yeah, the, this, the revival, the cultural revival of our people that Uncle Moogie's driving with Ringabalan, we all need to get on board and we need to make that grow. And it needs to go outside of just Aboriginal people. All people in the basin need to understand the spirituality and the culture that's connected to the waters. And uh, once we can get that message across, everybody will feel that connection. And uh, you know, once you're connected to something, you want to look after it. So that's our hope for the future. In ceremony, you've got people coming together. You've got people asking questions. You've got people wanting to be involved. All of that shows you and tells you that people want to join you. They want to join this, join this move to, to learn about this land, learn about the stories, learn about the, the culture of the land they live in, which is, which is only right. They should. And you can't force it on anyone. If they want to learn, that's all right. If they don't want to learn, that's okay too. Our culture is still very strong. And there's people out there that's hungry for it. They thirst for that, for that ceremony. They thirst. It's, it, it's like going through life and there's something missing. You can't put your finger on it. You don't know what it is. But once you do ceremony, once you go through it, that's what it is. That's missing in our lives. Doesn't matter where you was brought up. Ceremony will fill that gap that's in your life. If we want to heal the country, no good going there sick to heal sick country because it don't work. We have to be healed. All the wounds that we've suffered, all the, all the atrocities that, that was committed against us, that we still carry. We don't know we carry it. It's there. We have to, we have to deal with that first. And you can only do that through ceremony. You can only heal yourself through ceremony. You can only do a healing ceremony if you're healed. So I'd like to invite everyone to ceremony, to the Ringbalan. Come and be part of that healing ceremony of this country of your country, of your nation, your people, so that we start healing ourselves. <laughs>